Your spinal column is composed of 26 individual bones. The 24 vertebrae, which can be divided into the 7 cervical vertebrae of the neck, 12 thoracic vertebrae of the chest, and 5 lumbar vertebrae of the lower back, the sacrum, and the coccyx. This unique arrangement allows the spine to remain flexible enough to permit movement in all planes, whilst being strong and rigid enough to support the weight of the upper body and still protect the important spinal cord and spinal nerves that travel within and nearby to it. Between the vertebrae are a number of complex joints, but the ones we're interested in today are the large fibrocartilaginous joints between the bodies of the vertebrae. More specifically, these joints are between the inferior end plate of the vertebrae above and the superior end plate of the vertebra below, like this. We call these joints fibrocartilaginous because they consist of a mixture of white fibrous tissue and cartilage, which gives the joints a unique combination of strength and elasticity. Anatomists refer to these fibrocartilaginous structures as the intervertebral discs. There are 23 intervertebral discs, the most superior lying between the second and third cervical vertebra, and the most inferior lying between the fifth lumbar vertebra and the sacrum. Although there's some variation, the discs generally get larger as you move down the spinal column. We name the intervertebral discs after the vertebrae they connect, for example the C2-C3 disc, or the L5-S1 disc. All 23 of the discs have a similar structure, composed of an outer fibrous ring, known as the annulus fibrosus, and an inner gel-like centre known as the nucleus pulposus. At their top and bottom, the discs have an interface with their adjacent vertebra, known as the cartilaginous end plate. A healthy disc is symmetrical, with the nucleus sitting in the midline coronally, deviated slightly towards the posterior. Let's look at these areas a bit more closely. The annulus fibrosus is composed of a series of 15 to 25 concentric lamellae, with collagen fibres arranged in alternating complementary directions at 60 degrees to the vertical axis. Between these lamellae are glycoproteins, proteoglycans and elastin fibres which trap water and help the disc return to a normal shape after being stretched. You can further subdivide the annulus into an outer and inner portion, with the outer containing mostly type 1 collagen and the inner containing increasingly greater proportions of type 2 collagen as you move towards the centre. Anatomists will sometimes refer to the inner annulus as the transition zone as it gradually transitions into the nucleus. The annulus is strong and tough and acts to contain the softer nucleus inside as well as holding its two vertebrae together and withstanding mechanical forces acting on the spine. In contrast to the annulus, the nucleus pulposus is composed mostly of water which is suspended in a matrix of mostly type 2 collagen and proteoglycans. The arrangement of these structures is much looser as the nucleus is not intended to withstand mechanical stresses in the same way as the annulus. Instead it acts to absorb compressive forces as the spinal column is loaded and redistribute these forces to the surrounding connective tissues. The flexibility of the nucleus also allows it to move around a little within the intervertebral disc, increasing the flexibility of the spine. As people age, the nucleus becomes more rigid and gradually transitions from type 2 to type 1 collagen, reducing its usefulness as a shock absorber and reducing the flexibility of the spine. Lastly, the cartilaginous end plate is composed mostly of horizontally arranged collagen fibres at the interface of the disc and its adjoining vertebral bodies. These end plates play an important role during growth as most of the nutritional supply to the disc diffuses across them. However, in the adult, calcification of these end plates eventually leads to the devascularization of the disc. Now that's the important anatomical aspects of the disc that I'd like to cover. However, I've mentioned a few ways the disc changes as you get older. Together, we call these changes degenerative disc disease, and they can be exacerbated by other factors such as increased body weight or smoking. As well as the disc becoming more fibrous and less hydrated, small tears begin to appear in the annulus fibrosus, the disc reduces in height, and bony projections known as osteophytes form from the surrounding vertebrae. As the annulus of the disc becomes weaker and more rigid, the small tears accumulate and the nucleus is able to push through its containing wall, in a process known as disc herniation. This can range from simple nucleus protrusion to extrusion to completely free fragments leaving the disc space entirely. The consequence of this nucleus herniation is that the delicate spinal nerves that exit the spinal canal behind the disc can become compressed, 
leading to a range of symptoms including numbness, pain and loss of function. One well-known condition associated with disc herniation is sciatica, which can present as a severe shooting pain down the back and side of the leg. OK, that's everything on the intervertebral disc for now. Be sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future uploads where I'll be covering the anatomy of the vertebral bones themselves, as well as many other regions of the human body. In the meantime, I hope you learned something and have a great day.